Ready? Okay, well, let's pray. Hallelujah, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, eternal God, wellspring of joy and life, light and love, glory. And Lord, you are holy and your presence is holy. And we thank you for the reality, Lord Jesus, of your blood, that by your death, by the power and application of the Holy Spirit, we are cleansed and made holy to enter in, to live in your glorious presence forever. And Lord, I pray that as David said in Psalm 16, and it's prophetic of Jesus, who said in your presence is fullness of joy. May the joy of who you are fill our lives and overflow, O oh Lord, in all that we do and all that you do in and through us. Lord, we thank you for this time and we would set it apart to you. And we pray as always, come Holy Spirit, apart from you, O oh Lord, apart from your anointing presence and power, our words are lifeless, they're a dead letter, and worse than that, they kill, as the Bible says. You are the one who brings life, so come and bring life. Lord, in these words, we bind the power of the enemy and pray for illumination, revelation, and transformation. So guide and direct us now. We trust you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, today we're uh, looking at a huge, it's kind of like a Thanksgiving meal. You know, you got the whole turkey here. It's hard to put it in a, I guess, 45 minute, uh, you know, a little teaching. But uh, chapter five begins a new section in the Gospel of John with the pattern of a sign followed by a lengthy discourse or perhaps a dialogue, depending, but technically they're called discourses concerning who Jesus is. And in certain ways, I was thinking, I didn't put this in here, but, you know, as I mentioned, the, uh, the first 18 verses are, uh, in a sense, the overture to the movie, the symphony. And here is another movement in the analogy of uh, the Gospel of John, because it begins basically this pattern of a sign followed by discourse about who Jesus is. And also, this chapter, chapter 5, is foundational for what takes place following. We've had testimony and witnesses or statements about Jesus, who he is. But here, we come down to what is absolutely the most important thing. It is the foremost issue of salvation. And when I say foremost, I mean, in the logic of theology, this is true. Because what Jesus did to die on the cross for our sins and rise from the dead depends on who he is. So who he is, is the priority, and it's the priority of everything in life in the universe. And so in this chapter now, and in this primarily the dialogue here, uh, we have the testimony of Jesus himself about who he is. The following uh, discourses, we'll talk about what you call attributes or characteristics of Jesus, where he says, chapter six, he's the bread of life, you know, moving on, he's the light of the world, uh, chapter 11, he's the resurrection and the life. But here is the foundational reality, because it is who Jesus is, that is absolutely critical. And in these words, from Jesus's own mouth, we have testimony, and that's the technical word or witness, from him about who he is, and then his sustaining evidences or proofs to his testimony. Now, the outline you can see here, uh, verses 1 through 9a, and an invalid, that's the way the ESV translates that word, man is made whole. Uh, it says healed, but we'll get into that in a little bit. Then the next section, 9b through 13, the man is confronted by the, quote, Jews. And the reason I put, quote, Jews is because this is the way John speaks of primarily the religious leadership. There's also Jews that are the Jews from Jews come salvation, chapter four. So it's the work of God through the ethnic people. But here, as John is using it, it is the religious authorities who are primarily opposed to Jesus. 
So this man who was healed, made whole by Jesus, is confronted by the Jews about breaking the Sabbath. Then Jesus finds the man and he warns him not to sin anymore. Verses 15 through 16. Then the man goes and tells the Jews, Jesus made him whole, and they begin to persecute Jesus. 17 and 18, the Jews seek to kill Jesus because his reason for working on the Sabbath is judged to be blasphemy because he, a man, claims to be equal with God. Moving on from that is a major portion of the, uh, in two parts of the chapter, beginning verse 19. And if you look at, you got a red letter Bible, it's all red uh, because it's Jesus' own words. Jesus gives numerous reasons why he is equal with God. And then uh, 31 through 47, he presents five witnesses to corroborate or confirm his own testimony. Now, in verses 1, 9, uh, 1 through 9, uh, it has, uh, we can read there, we don't have a, have a lot of time, but basically what John says is it is a feast, it's not an identified feast, uh, which is the only feast that's not identified, which is interesting, but uh, it's, there's this colonnade of uh, a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, and uh, it has, it's a five roofed colonnades, and, or, or sometimes it's called porches. In these lay a multitude of invalids, and then the variety of these are blind, lame, paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there for a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? The Greek word there is, do you desire to be healed? Uh, I just have to laugh. The guy's been there 38 years, and Jesus asked him, do you want to get healed? <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, i just waiting for the hamburgers to come by, the hors d'oeuvres. <laughs> I get a free meal there. <laughs> you know, uh, the, the sick man answered, sir, uh, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, and while I am going another steps down, Jesus said to him, get up. Take up your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed and he took up his, bread, uh, his bed and walked. Now, Bethesda, the word means either house of mercy or flowing waters. All right. And, uh, you know, you have scholars that are different depending on the tradition. But I think in terms of the symbolism, because John is saturated with symbols, okay, of uh, the communication of the truth of God. And so here's this man at a pool. It's a pool where uh, a location where people have been healed. And undoubtedly, it's been a long time this is happening. It's not like they've been laying there. This guy's been there 38 years. So this is a long time, whatever, you know, it's, uh, it, the text says, you know, people, the water stirred. The first person into it is healed. And it's like other places, you know, in the world where, you know, God's presence or whatever, sometimes it's really demonic, uh, but people are healed. And so there's a, where in one sense, you could say that the atmosphere between heaven and earth is thin because the presence of God moves as he is pleased. Now the five, uh, the context, uh, the five roof colonnades can be symbolic of the five books of the law of Moses. And so in this context, here's this man who is powerless, and it symbolizes his inability to cleanse himself from sin, okay? Similar to the water pots in chapter 2, where Jesus turned the water into wine. All right, moving to the next page. Now, it says, Jesus sees an invalid lying there and is given a word of knowledge that the man has been there 38 years. Now, I emphasize this because again we will see Jesus knowing things some things he knew because of his divine nature he knew exactly who he was all right other things it's where his humanity is and the Holy Spirit anoints him and gives him understanding revelation uh, we see this for example at the woman at the well you know uh, you say correctly for the person 
you've had five husbands and the guy you're living with isn't your husband. So 38 years, and this is important because 38 years was a period of time the people of Israel were condemned to wander in the wilderness because of unbelief. Now, basically you say 40 years, but the first two, they came out of Egypt and they were two years at Mount Sinai. So the, technically the judgment of God was upon them for 38 years. Okay, so this again is background. Here's a man who is in the wilderness of his life um, for whatever reason. Now, this is important. The Greek word translated invalid in the NIV or ESV means weakness, infirmity, disease, sickness, feebleness, or without power. All right. Now, that's how I want to emphasize it without power. You know, have you ever turned your flashlight on out in the dark and it doesn't work? You know, you don't really say, well, it's weak, it's sick. You know, it's an invalid because if it did, it'd have a little power. Primarily what it's saying is you got no power. He has no power to get into the pool uh, so that he can be healed. And so uh, fundamentally, it is a lack of strength and, and power. This man had no power to enter the pool to be healed. This is... I think one reason, you know, God has this reason, what one reason why God chose this man. He'd been there 38 years. He is powerless to be able to heal himself. And so it represents a human being in relationship. Here he is, five colonnades to the law of God. As Paul says in Romans 8, 3, for God has done what the law weakened, powerless by the flesh could not do. Here is the absolute inability of human nature either to achieve what God requires or to make ourselves into what God uh, would require or even more so cleanse ourselves from the unrighteousness and pollution of sin. Now the next important things in, in terms of the context and the translation this is where sadly you know English you don't really get the whole uh, as one of my professors said in seminary, translating is like pouring honey from one jar to another. You get honey, but there's so much still left on the inside. And so the, this next word is very important, as I would understand that in the whole context. Now, uh, Jesus makes the man whole. Jesus initiates interaction with the man with the question, do you want to be healed? The Greek word translated in this uh, ESV, healed or well means whole, okay? The next statement is important. This is critical to the context because wholeness is an attribute of holiness. Now, where you see this especially is where in Leviticus or the offerings where God says it cannot be with blemish. It has to be unblemished. The main idea, Tom is a, is a Hebrew word, but it means whole. Sometimes the idea is perfect. But where there was a blemish, a handicap, you know, with priests, for example, they could not enter the presence of God. Holiness is wholeness. All right. So in the context, the fourth commandment is to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. As all the gospels show, and as the gospel, this gospel, John goes on to bring out again in chapter nine, with the healing of the man born blind. One of the fun, foremost places of Jesus's conflict with and cause of rejection by the Jews was their accusation that he did not keep the Sabbath. All right, you read the gospels and here again, he's not keeping the Sabbath according to their particular judgments and legal system. Now, Jesus healed on the Sabbath. In fact, he purposely healed on the Sabbath. Here we see it. Why is it? Is he breaking the Sabbath? Because the Jews accuse him of breaking the Sabbath. The answer is absolutely not. If it is to keep it holy and wholeness is an essential element of being holy, Jesus is making this man holy. He's making him whole. And so he is fulfilling the purpose of the Sabbath, which is for us to be made holy and whole in our relationship with God. Now, the man is made whole when he hears 
the voice of Jesus saying, get up, take up your bed and walk, then does what Jesus says. Now, again, here's another place where the English, you really can't get what's going on in terms of whole context. It is critical to understand in the larger context of what Jesus says in the discourse that the Greek word translated get up is literally rise, rise up. And this is a sign that the man is raised by the voice of Jesus, because as Jesus goes on to say, he has the power to give life, to raise people from the dead. And how does that happen? He says, they will hear the voice of the son and hearing his voice, they will be given life and raised. And so this is the demonstration of power of life and to give life through his voice. Now, the next section, again, is the man is confronted by the Jews about breaking the Sabbath. And as I said, uh, you know, years, the centuries, Jewish rabbis had, in order to, they realized, well, I don't know, get on, but basically they just put uh, what is called the fence around the commandment. So their idea was let's fence off whatever actions we might judge to be potentiation of the commandment. And so you get all of these laws. I think there's almost 40 different specific things that the Jews rabbis had that you cannot do on the Sabbath. And notice it's the content and purpose of the religion is basically what you can't do. It's not much life. Don't violate God's law. You're going to get it, which, you know, I mean, there is that reality. But Jesus is making people whole. Now, as I said, this man is violating, in their opinion, the one of these laws or regulations because he's carrying his bed. And I think today, you know, most of us don't hang around or we're not really uh, in a culture with observant Jewish people. If you went to Israel, you would. I remember one day we were in Jerusalem and driving along and this crowd of observant you know, orth, you know, orthodox, you know, the guys with the curls and everything comes out where somebody was in a car and they begin to assault this person because they're driving on the Sabbath and it was breaking the Sabbath. So it goes on there. But also think about this, as I mentioned here, basically this is religion. It's not just the Jews. It is fundamentally human religion that you create some kind of law, some kind of regulation by which you have the power and requirement to do in order to fulfill that your God can be pleased and you can achieve what whatever the goal is, nirvana or, uh, you know, paradise, you know, and think about, again, when you think of the religion of Islam, okay, what is their uh, motivation of the, whatever you want to call it, you know, what do they call those people? Uh, they're, jihadists. Well, the jihadists, but basically the ones that are really believe what their book says, basically. I can't remember. See, our culture creates these people that are real Muslims who really don't kill people. And then the Quran says, if you're a real Muslim, jihad, you go out and kill unbelievers. Okay, that's their religion. And that's what's happening in other parts of the world. All right, but Sharia is what they want to give. It's basically the same thing as the kingdom of God. We believe in the kingdom of God, the law of God written on your heart. But see, our law is love. We love people. Their law is death. It's the symbol of the sword. Anyway, I don't need to get into that. But we need to be aware of it. <clears throat> so you have religious police everywhere, quote unquote. It's in fundamental churches. Some people grow up in it. You know, it's a fundamentalist quote unquote church where it's like, you know, don't, 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 don't. People live under condemnation and judgment instead of grace and, and freedom. All right. Verse 14, Jesus warns the man not to sin anymore. All right. Now, what's important here is that in our day and age, people want to disconnect sin from sickness. Okay, you always hear this in the quote Jesus in John chapter 9 saying, the response to the disciples who sin, this man or his parents, and Jesus says, neither. And then they'll say, well, see, Jesus doesn't connect sin with sickness. That's not what he said. Okay, here he connects sin with sickness, and you can read in other places, which I quote, sin with sickness. Why do we get sick? Why do we have disease? One way or another, it can either be our own personal 
acts, all right, one way or another, that's the way the world is, or if we're whatever healthy, you have the power of death operating in you. I don't care how good, how powerful you walk in the spirit, you're on your way to die, all right? It's going to break down and die because why? That's the world in which we live in. And it's the cause of this is ultimately Adam. As in Adam, all die. But in Christ shall all be made alive. Romans 12, 5, 12. Through one man, sin entered the world and death through sin. So the Bible speaks of here, this man, Jesus' own words warning him, don't go on sinning or something worse will happen to you. Clearly, he connects the act of personal sin here with illness or sickness. And what could be the worst? Well, it could be that he would, as Jesus said about demons, when a demon is cast out and, and a house is made clean and seven worse come and got the end of it is worse. It could be like that. The guy could get worse sin, or I think that's the right English. Anyway, sicker <laughs> on a relative scale, or really probably saying, you know, you're on your way to perishing. And so what he's saying is that true faith demonstrates a life that is repentant and turning away from sin. This is again what our culture needs to hear because you have what is false grace. Grace that like Bonhoeffer said, you know, cheap grace. I hear people, I don't know, I don't want to get into that, but it comes into your heart. You come into saving faith and the power of the life-giving Holy Spirit in you, Christ in you, changes your life so that you bear fruit, that you are a true follower of Christ, where people say you're saved by works and it doesn't matter what kind of works you have in your life. They're not speaking by the Holy Spirit, okay? That's false. Here Jesus warns the guy. Anyway, moving on. Yes. Do you think there's a connection then with Jesus asking him if he wanted to get well, and a connection that there was sin associated with this? Well, that's a good insight. It, yeah, that's a possibility, you know, because it doesn't say it, but it certainly is, because, you know, a lot of times you can only guesstimate. That's a technical word, you know, guesstimate. Uh, you know, okay, does a guy love his situation? I wouldn't necessarily say that because he's been there 38 years, but you never know. But healing then brings a different life. If you're an invalid and people have taken care of you and Jesus heals you, you're now responsible to go out and live a productive life to whatever degree you can, you know, before God, because that's what God has made us to do. So maybe that's part of it too. All right. Uh, the man tells Jesus uh, made him whole and they persecute Jesus. Now, as I bring out the word um, persecute, it's not just a one time. It is Imperfect is a Greek, which means it started in the past and it is continually effect. So what John is bringing out is this was an attitude that the Jews already had toward Jesus. Now the healing on the Sabbath amplifies this and uh, they're wanting to persecute him. Now, as I point out here, and I think this is very important, the actions outside, this persecution of Jesus, and by the way, those who are Christ. It's the fruit of two diametrically opposed spirits. One, the Holy Spirit of God who anointed Jesus to make people whole and holy. And that Holy Spirit, he lives within us. And we are the body of Christ. The other is the spirit of Antichrist that is against the spirit of Christ, the Messiah on Jesus and keeps people in bondage to the effects of sin. So as Paul said later in 2 Corinthians, the letter kills, the spirit gives life. Now, 17 and 18, the Jews seek to kill Jesus because his reason for working on the Sabbath is judged to be blasphemy because he, a man, claims to be equal with God. So he says, my father is working until now, and I am working. This is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because not only was he breaking, quote unquote, in their judgment, the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Now, 
The answer, as it says in the Greek that Jesus gives to the charge of breaking the Sabbath is based upon the biblical and theological understanding that the Jews correctly had about God. All right, we read in Genesis chapter two, God rested on the Sabbath, all right? But what everybody who is observant can understand is when you look around the world, the world doesn't stop running on the Sabbath day. You know, God doesn't stop running the universe. You know, I'm gonna sit back, I'm taking a break now. And so what they understood is that the reason that the universe, quote unquote, continues to run is because God continues to work. 24-7. If God stopped working to sustain the universe, to keep the universe going the way it is, and it's just mind-boggling way, people don't even know how intimate and intricate it is. Well, then it all collapsed. You know, the picture I have is, uh, you know, those uh, Christmas uh, decorations people put in front, those big balloon things, and they got the little air thing blowing it in, you know, whatever it is, the reindeer, Santa Claus, or whatever. You know, as long as that machine is blowing, but if that power stops, all right, that's the way the universe is. If God stopped working, everything would, would run down. So the Jews understand this. So Jesus is saying, I am working. And my father, as my father is working, they know immediately what Jesus is talking about. He's claiming to be God. And so they judge it to be blasphemy because God himself has said, I will not share my glory with, with anyone else. And the punishment in the scripture for blasphemy is death. You can read the references there. So this is biblical. As they understand, they're executing what God has said in his word to do. This guy here is blaspheming. He deserves death. Now, I want to emphasize this again. This is in, for example, Islam. When Muslims put people to death for blasphemy, by it's the same principle. And I want to say this understanding those people are true believers. They're not messing around. They really believe what their book says. That's a rebuke to so many Christians who profess faith in Jesus. And we don't, we're not zealous and absolutely committed to what Jesus said, how we are to live our lives uh, in following him. Now, what is most important to observe is that if Jesus is not equal with God, he could have, and notice these words, should have morally and theologically immediately denied the charge as a complete misunderstanding. They're saying you're making yourself equal with God. He should have immediately said, oh, no, no, I'm sorry. You got it wrong. I mean, what if somebody came up to you and says, oh, you're God. What should we do? Oh, thank you very much. I knew it all along. As I look at myself in the mirror, I could see. But anyway. Yeah, that's why they have dogs. Yeah, they worship. You know, about that reminds me of the dyslexic uh, atheist who couldn't sleep at night who wondered if there was a dog. <laughs> Got mixed up God and dog. <laughs> anyway. Sorry. <laughs> so where was I back to where? Okay. So, um, <clears throat> so now, so to the contrary, Jesus then gives a number of reasons in the following context of why he's equal with God to sustain his testimony. Now, turn the page. And C.S. Lewis insightfully made clear, Jesus's claim to be God leaves only three options. He's either a lunatic claiming to be God, and he's completely deluded, insane. He's a liar. He knows he's not God, but nevertheless, he claims to be, or he's exactly who he says he is. That's ultimately the issue of eternal salvation. And the reason we believe who Jesus is, is the grace of God that the Holy Spirit has granted to us to believe, to see, and confess who Jesus is. And that reality in your heart that you truly believe with all your heart who Jesus is, is one of the most important assurances 
that you are truly his and that you are saved and have eternal life. You're on your way to heaven and then ultimately the new heaven and the new earth. Now, Jesus uh, goes on then to give numerous reasons why he is equal with God. I'm not going to read all this. I want to read the first verse, what he says. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, that is what the son does. Now, moving on down, <clears throat> you can see just about the structure if you're interested, but his arguments are as follows. Verse 19, and this is important. To prove he is equal with God, Jesus gives three categorical statements. These are absolutes, all right? And the first is this, the categorical absolute, the son can do nothing, and it's translated in the ESV of his own accord. Now, first, he states what is called a categorical negative. It's an absolute, meaning that he would have no power to do what he is doing and does if he was not who he says he is. All right. So it's a, the proof that I am who I am, say I am, is what is taking place. Literally, and this is important, the son is not being empowered. Uh, the Greek word is not, is, is dunamis. Okay. That's a Greek, that's a noun, but, uh, but dunomai is a verb. So he has no power in and of himself to do what he is doing from himself, out of himself. The Greek is present tense. So what he is doing is not originating out of his self. He states that just as the father is working on the Sabbath, so he could not be doing the works of God out of his own individual personal power unless the father was doing the works. Now, this is important in terms of Trinity, and I'll, I'll mention that in a, in a minute. The second thing, but only what he sees the father doing. This is the corresponding categorical positive, declaring his absolute, complete, and unhindered relationship with the father, that he sees what the father is doing. Now, this goes back to John chapter 1, a verse. Do you remember what I might have said? The word uh, pros is the Greek. The word was with God which means his whole being, his face is toward the father. The son's being is in absolute perfect union with the father, face to face, heart to heart. And so he sees absolutely what the father is doing. And this is a declaration, again, of deity. Um, no, no human being left to himself can see God in the way Jesus is speaking of it. The Bible does speak of God, people seeing God in one sense or another. You know, we are children of God. We're born of God. So by being born of the spirit, we can see the things of God. But we don't see unhindered. You know, you're not walking around going, okay, God is working by the power of the Holy Spirit here. I see all the angelic realm. I see everything here. This is the world Jesus is. The best way to think of it is a transfiguration. You know, when his humanity was pulled back and the power of the reality, that's the world he's living in. That's the world that the demons saw when they showed up and they go, oh, we're in trouble. All right. so he sees every way in terms of application. One of the most important statements about the dynamic of ministry in the spirit, that we must have our senses alive to discern what God is doing so that we can do what he is doing. Now, I could spend a long time on that, but for us to do ministry as the body of Christ, according to our gifts, it is in the power of the spirit. And we must be alive. We must be sensing, aware of what God is doing through us or through other people. Romans 12, 2, our minds are to be transformed so that we can perceive, discern what, what God is doing. Okay, uh, page five. Again, for whatever the son does, it's equal with the father that he does what the father does. Now, these are categorical statements that, de that uh, and Jesus declares two principles of Trinitarian theology. First, 
the priority and relationship of dependence on the father that the in the in, uh, that is in the Trinitarian formula all comes from the Father through the Son by the Holy Spirit. Distinctions are one God, three persons. Uh, then the subordination of the Son. Some people don't like that, but see, you can be equal in nature, but subordinate in role. All right? I mean, think about it here. Okay. How many human beings go to St. Michael's. How many people work at St. Michael's? But who has authority ecclesiastically at St. Michael's? <laughs> you know, different people have authority, but we're all equal in our humanity. All right, does that make sense? All right, verse 20. The motivation and purpose of God for Jesus doing the works. I love this. First of all, the motivation of the Father is his love for the Son. Why does God do this through his Son? He loves the Son. People ask why? Well, that's very simple. God loves the Son. God is love. He loves the Son. Father loves the Son and shows him all that he is doing. One purpose for Jesus' works is also that people would marvel or be astonished. Isn't that cool? <laughs> God wants to do works, power. And part of our cultural problem in since the quote unquote enlightenment and unbelief where you know it's anti-supernatural is we don't live in a supernatural world except that it's up there. It's not like God is working here doing what we would call miracles, power here, there. This, you know, the, the other world believes in the interface of the spirit realm and the works of God manifesting. You know, why do we have to go to India, so to speak, you know, to do see God? God should be doing works here. Now he does, thank God, but he should be doing more because God wants to show up. Why? Because works or miracles or signs are a means God uses to bring us to salvation. By the way, what is the greatest sign to show us who Jesus is, that he is the way of salvation? What? Raised from the dead. God has given evidence to all people by raising him from, that's the greatest sign there is. That's the work of God. Our hope is not just based upon because somebody told me so. It is because of actual history. We believe in truth and what is reality of the God who lives and works. <clears throat> now, in the moments we have, Jesus identifies two exclusive works of God <clears throat> that the Father has given him to do. First of all, he raises the dead. Two ways he raises the dead, spiritual resurrection and physical resurrection. Spiritual resurrection takes place now. When you are born of the spirit, you are raised from physical, I mean, spiritual death. When we're born in Adam, we're born separated from God. As Paul says in Ephesians, we're born dead separated from God. When we're God, as Paul said, may you lie, you believe in Jesus and that your heart has been transformed to want to live for him. All right, that takes place now. But then comes spiritual resurrection, which I mean, physical resurrection. The hour is coming when all who are in the tombs, it's not exclusive, it's figurative because some people aren't in tombs. In fact, most people aren't. Anyway, that was contextual for the Jews. Anyway, I don't think I'm going to be in a tomb if I live that long to die. Anyway, as, uh, and then moving on to B, as demonstrated uh, in the powerless man who made, who was made whole, people are raised by hearing the voice of Jesus. Now, how did you hear the voice of Jesus? Because the Holy Spirit opened your ears, the ears of your heart to hear and believe. Maybe you never where you can't put on your calendar, that was a date. Maybe, quote unquote, you could, some people like always believe. You know, it's not a religious always believe. You truly believe. 
You know, some people are like that, but somewhere in your heart, you came to truly believe in Jesus. Okay. Why? Moving on to verse uh, page six. Two reasons the dead are raised by Jesus is that the son gives life to whom he will and uh, he, uh, for who he, who he will, for as the father has life in himself, so he has granted the son to also have life in himself. Now, <clears throat> so that is a category. I don't want to spend time on these, but basically it's fundamentally this. God is a living God. He has created life. His will in terms of intention, desire, holy desire is for life. We fell in Adam. God gives us life in Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. That life is eternal. And when it's eternal, it's not just simply length of days. It is the quality of life. It will never die, cannot die. And so you are living forever because Jesus raised you from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. Then number two, judgment has been given to him. The reasons that God the Father has given judgment to him. First of all, that all may honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. Now think about that. This is another thing that Jews could have picked up a <laughs> stone and stone Jesus said. He's claiming equal honor with God the Father, equal glory. And what he absolutely declares is that if you don't honor me, you dishonor God. You're picking up stones to kill me. Truly believe in the true living God. You don't honor the Father because you are not honoring and believing in me. These are, I'm, I'm going to say this. Awesome, sober, even terrifying words. Because so many people in cultures go, well, they believe in Jesus. Or they, you know, well, they don't believe in the right Jesus. You know, false doctrine. Or, you know, certain people, well, they believe in God. It doesn't matter. You have to believe in the true Jesus to believe in the true God. And if we don't, we're not honoring the true God. Second is because he's the son of man. Now, you can read about that, uh, basically, why that's important. Now, Jesus then gives five witnesses that testify to who he is. Moving on. Okay. <clears throat> and I'll just make a comment. He says, after this testimony that, that his works prove he is equal with God, his testimony transitions. He's been telling them, these are the things that prove. And when I say prove, I mean prove. Because some people will say you can't prove. No, you can prove. It's just do people believe? I can prove two plus two equals belief. Jesus proves through these testimonies the, what he's saying. He's And so he says, okay, now he's transitioning to them. It's a legal proceeding. If I bear witness about myself, as he says, my testimony is not true. Now, what he is not saying is that it's false. This is a legal precedent that testimony has to be confirmed by two or three witnesses. So what he's saying is that, okay, in order to validate, in order to confirm what I am saying, I'm going to bring to you five witnesses, so to speak, to the witness stand. These are John the Baptist, as he says. Uh, the works the Father has given him, the Father himself, and the scriptures, and then Moses. And I just want to make one other statement in the middle of page seven. This is important. And you can read the other, other parts because we don't have time. But concerning the power of the scriptures, and I'm, I want to say this, I want to say this pastorally, kindly, and I, I'm, I'm, so to speak, pulling rank here, if you want to say it as scholar and resident. <laughs> I hear Christians all the time saying the God's word has power and their idea is that just preach the word people will believe. Okay, it's important to understand that left to itself, the word of God does not have power. 
Now that may be hard for people to believe, but here are these people, they search the scriptures. They don't believe. They have the word of God. Their whole life is devoted to the word of God. The parable of the sower, Jesus cast the word. God, the son incarnate, preaching and teaching the word of God. You have four categories, only one category actually truly believed. The word came in, they didn't believe, it fell. Now the word of God, and this is what I'm, what I'm the point of application. The word of God is like seed. You're a, you garden, you garden. If you throw seed on blacktop, what's going to happen to it? Will it cause life to grow? It doesn't have power left to itself. The only way the seed is germinated, the power within it is released, is by water. The water power of the Holy Spirit must take the truth of the word, and this is why we must proclaim the word of God always, so that the Holy Spirit can take those words and make them alive. It shows our absolute dependence upon God, upon the Holy Spirit, our absolute need to pray for the Holy Spirit to work in us, through us, in the hearts of people. The word of God becomes alive by the life-giving power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. All right. Father, we bow before you. And even in this, Lord, left to ourselves, we're blind, we're dead, rebels, but you in your grace have saved us. And I pray now your blessing upon your people. Holy Spirit, fill us. Open our eyes more and more to see the reality of who Jesus is, for you have come to glorify Jesus. Fill us with the power that you give in our gifts. Move through us in our church, in our community, in our state, in the world, to bring life through the word of God, so that Jesus, the living word of God, may be glorified. And so we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, take this home and you can read more.